Uh, my name is Kai Dickens, and the film is Soul Survivor, and this is Amy McIntyre. Thank you. Absolutely. Of course, how did you meet George, and how did that, how did you get involved with this, with telling his story and, and the larger story? Right, for sure. Well, I, um, I, I mean, start from someplace personal. Uh, when I was in high school, I uh, nearly I just missed an accident. I was switched places with a friend in a car crash, um, and he ended up dying, and I lived. And I didn't realize I had survivor's guilt until years later, when um, it kind of became clear in my late twenties. And I wanted to try to figure out how to heal from it. And I started reading about survivors, and I came across on the internet a story about a sole survivor of a plane crash, and thought, oh my God, that's the nth degree of survivorship. You know, it's so public and acute, and so um, so disastrous that if a sole survivor from a plane crash can heal, I'm sure I can learn something about survivor's guilt from them. And I couldn't find the person I read the article about, but I researched this guy, George Lampson, who was an American sole survivor. And of course, I found him on Facebook, the way you find anyone these days. And uh, we started kind of emailing. Um, it really, it started out as kind of an inquiry, but we ended up meeting kind of, I was out in Reno for vacation. Um, we had lunch, and he told me he'd always wanted to meet other survivors, but he doesn't have, this is kind of it's cute, he's like, I don't have a wife, I'm not close to my mom, and I don't feel like anyone's pushing me along, and I can't push myself along. And I thought, well, that's too bad. And I was like, well, I'm a documentary filmmaker, I can follow you, kind of just joking. And he's like, well, yeah, I mean, that, that's a really good idea. Like, maybe that would help me. At least I'd, at least I'd try, and we can see where it goes. And then he kind of had to think about it because he was nervous after throwing that on the table, which anyone would be. Um, you know, these scary stories are very hard to tell, so it took a lot of bravery for George to get to that point. And then, um, and then he did, and then the story kind of came from there. And in terms of uh, Jim and, and uh, the other the other people, now is that something that you led the charge on, or was George leading the charge on? on well, it's interesting because you know George had connected with C Cecilia um, years before, and but you know Cecilia is very private, understandably so, and um, has never really participated in the media. And then she ended up contacting us. Um, she found out about our Kickstarter campaign, and we've been in touch with a lot of people from the Northwest 255 family, some are here tonight, and um, they let her know about the film, and she contacted us and said, I want to get involved, which of course thrilled George. Um, George connected with Baya and about seven other survivors who aren't in the film, but he still talks to them and has connected a bunch of other people, which is really cool. Um, and then Jim, George tried connecting with Jim, and Jim really felt that you know no one can understand him. He's not one of this group because he was a, a pilot and not a passenger. Um, and then so I wrote Jim a letter and we ended up starting to communicate and um, I got Jim involved that way because I think he had a deep desire to tell his story and really get his kind of side of what happened out there. Um, so there was a lot of purpose in Jim getting involved for that purpose, yeah. So um, I'll jump in again if I need to, but uh, I'm sure there's lots of questions. Let's start right there. Hi, thank you very much. It was uh, a fascinating project. I, I, and so I liked um, everything that I saw about it. However, I was very, very curious um, and surprised, frankly, at uh, the very end of the movie. It felt um, to me almost as um, um, like a setup, frankly. Yeah. And what I mean by that is, is that I was <laughs> so looking forward to uh, the conversation that I expected at the end of the movie between the co-pilot, now his name is Jim. Jim, yeah. The co-pilot. Yeah. Um, and George. Yeah. I mean, the cameras were on him, you know, they were yeah. mic'd and ready to go. <laughs> totally. And uh, there was, um, I think, maybe one line of, of conversation between the two of them. Yeah. Low credits. Yeah. So um, I think, it, it, you know, the editing could be, have done a little bit differently so yeah. that that wasn't such a glaring um, you know, something missed yeah. um, to me. Um, so, do you, so, do you want, so I guess, so do you want to address? Well, yeah, sure, because that was actually a purposeful choice. You know, there's a ton of, of, of content from that, um, from that meeting, and there's so many other meetings that George had, and, you know, the, 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 their lives kept going on. Like, George kept meeting survivors. He still has met other people since the film wrapped, and, you know, I, I felt like their meeting, you know, Sure, it could have been great, but we could have kept going on and on with the film. And why I chose to end it where I did is it was the first time that George had actually reflected to the point that he, it was now in the past for him, not in, the, that, not in the present. So when he was talking to Jim and said, I've been there, that was like, boom. Like he's finally, like his mind has shifted to the point where now these people aren't helping him as much as I think that he originally needed, and now he felt like he was helping them. So that's why we ended it where we did. Yeah.
From the which accident? Is it the Brazilian airline? Brazilian airline. Oh, yeah. I want yeah. to note also the big airline crash uh, in, the, in the Canary Islands that took place a few years ago. Yeah. Where almost 500 people died. Yeah, there's uh, so many accidents that, you know, I wish we could have addressed. But you know, part of it is George wasn't able to get, or some of the people he did connect with, the lone survivors, didn't necessarily want to be in a movie. And so George has carried on those conversations and those friendships kind of off screen, which is awesome. Um, and then some of the, the accidents that have been so tragic we didn't cover because there was more than one survivor. And you know we really had to kind of figure out what the parameters to tell the story and having one sole survivor was the parameters we chose. Um, and then a few of the, the other people that, that we wish that we could have gotten to, especially George, he was looking so hard for certain addresses or you know phone numbers or email addresses, but he just couldn't find them, much, much like George and Cecilia and a lot of the lone survivors out there, you know, they don't want to be found. It, you grow up being so scared or you know, just live your life being very scared of what people may or may not um, think of your choices and how you lived your life. You know, how do you live your life out for 149 people or 79 people or however many died? And even though that might be a um, kind of an imagined guilt that they carry on their shoulders, it's very real. So that uh, the desire to have an anonymity about your life um, it persists in every lone survivor we've met. And that's what makes these four so brave to share their story. Absolutely. Another question? Oh, sorry. Did you, uh, did you figure out your uh, survivor's guilt? Yeah, I mean, one thing that happened while shooting is I would constantly hear George and um, Jim, of course, in particular, and even Baya worrying quite a lot about what people thought about them and what they should be doing and the choices that they were making. And of course, I didn't want to jump in too much, but in my mind, I'm thinking, just live your life, just be happy, just you know, love who you love and do what you do, and like, don't worry so much about it. We'll never find the answers, you know. Just embrace like where you are, and that kind of I started ingesting that myself, and certainly, yeah, it helped me a lot. Another question? I have a question on, on yeah. a follow up on um, on George's daughter because I, you know, you know, I love their relationship. Yeah. And I think it's a really a grounding thing for him, and it sort of pushes him in, a, in another way as well. How is how is she? Um, has she maintained contact with uh, with uh, Bye -bye? Yeah, yeah. Hannah's doing great. Um, she's starting to look into colleges. Um, she's thrilled that George has met someone, and that's that card that comes up at the end. Uh, it kind of takes the pressure off of her. So she's doing well, and she does keep in contact with Baya. Um, they're great Facebook buddies, and um, actually, Baya wants to take a trip to America, but she doesn't want to go to Reno. She wants to go to New York. So, <laughs> so they're planning a trip to New York at some point. Excellent. Really quick, you know, well, yeah, um, Frank Rapp, our, our composer who, who composed the film, is, is from French, France, and uh, he was the translator during a lot of the scenes. He's in the right. back, but if anyone wants to talk to Frank, because he... Yeah, Frank, if you can uh, just... Yeah, stand up, Frank. Stand up for a second. There you go. <laughs> great work. Frank, I also want to quickly thank our marketing manager, Kristen Kaza, who's here too. So there's a few people from the film present. But, um, but Frank was instrumental in, you know, with Baya, obviously translation is difficult with documentaries often. Um, and our, we were lucky enough that our composer was in France. So he um, helped with a lot of communication between George and Kasim and Baya and that type of thing. Right. So. Other questions? How is uh, George with uh, his date? <laughs> well, it's, it's sweet because they, you know, they really connected over their common tragedy and uh, she still lives in Minneapolis and he still lives in Reno and so they've kind of downshifted a bit just because neither one is ready to move for the other, but once Hannah's out of high school and into college, possibly they'll like bring it back to that level where one of them moves for the other. Over here. <laughs> Has Cecilia met with any of the other uh, families of some of the other victims from the 255? Um, I know she keeps in contact with a lot of them, and you know she they're um, she's Facebook friends with many of them. I know she talks to some of them on the phone, um, you know. But so she, yeah, I mean, there's a, a loving like closeness that she has. I don't know if she's ever met any of the families in person except for Joan, who's Joan. Raise your hand. <laughs> Uh, except for Joan, who was here, and she says in the film that she was the only person to ever meet Cecilia um, from that tragedy. Yeah. Yes. Hey, do any of the survivors have relationships with any of the other survivors outside of George? Yes. Um, Baya and Ruben Van Asau, who is a Dutch survivor, um, have started a relationship. They're both very young. You know, uh, Baya is now 16, and Ruben, I think, is now 12 or 13. Um, I know that that. 
uh, Cecilia was very interested in con connecting with Baya, and I'm not sure if she did, but I, I gave her Baya's email address, so I think that they were planning to connect. Um, there's a wonderful group in New York called Access, which connects survivors of different aviation disasters of all sorts with someone like them. And I remember Cecilia telling me once, I never got connected with anyone, because I'm the only person like me that was a lone survivor. And so when she read about Baya, she really wanted to connect with Baya, and I, I hope she's followed through on that. I'm not sure if she has.